My name is Forrest. I'm one of the elders here. Um, and so I'm doing what something, if you haven't been here for a bit, this is a, a thing we've been doing for uh, a while now, but it's a, we're calling it a pastoral prayer. Um, basically, it is the elders coming in and um, setting up like a, a prayer that we've prayed over ahead of time that we can pray together. Um, and I, part of the thing that, that's been on our hearts is that we... Um, Sometimes we breeze over the prayer or we use it as filler, right? <laughs> it's kind of like, we'll jump over to the next thing. We'll get through the prayer into the next thing. Um, and we kind of do the same thing with scripture sometimes. You know, we, we say, oh, we've heard this before. And we kind of, you know, we'll just, we'll just go through. So this morning, uh, I, I was reading through Matthew this week. And this morning, I just wanted to read a larger section of scripture um, slowly. And we can, uh, what, I, what I want to do is I want us to, um, to really let it soak in. And not just let it hit our heads, but let it hit our hearts. And then we'll pray. Uh, we'll pray in response afterwards. So um, please feel free to, to um, get in your prayer posture, whatever that is, as we read through this. Um, this is uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 34. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Father, we praise you for your care and provision. You oversee every detail of this vast universe that you have created, and you still care deeply and personally for each one of us. You owe us nothing, God, and still you take care of us. You have even promised to provide everything we need if we seek first your kingdom. We confess, God, that we have not rested in your care. Instead of relying on your provision and investing our lives into your future kingdom, we have gone out into this world and we've tried to build a kingdom for ourselves. We have called you our master and king, but we confess that we have made earthly peace and prosperity the rulers of our lives. God, we pray that you would strengthen our hands to tear down those idols of earthly peace and prosperity. Purify our hearts so that we can love you alone. Focus our minds on your kingdom and your work. Lord, you are worthy of all glory and honor and power and praise. 
Your love for us is beyond our comprehension. There is nothing in this fallen world that could ever compare with you. Help us to see these truths and live our lives in light of them. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name is uh, Elijah Sama. I would like to I would like to invite you to read uh, today's scripture together with me. Uh, I'll be reading John six twenty eight uh, through twenty nine. Then said to him. Then they said to him, uh, "What must we do to be doing the works of God?" Jesus answered them, "This is the works of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent." All right, it is time for Kids Church. I uh, want to remind you that uh, after the service at 11 o'clock, we have our Come for More classes and an opportunity to dive deeper together in God's Word. There's different, lots of different opportunities uh, from our littlest kids all the way up. So we encourage you, if you're interested, you say, hey, I want to get to know someone. I, I want to join one of these classes. Uh, just pick one that looks fun. Uh, if you're unsure where to go, uh, you can come ask me afterwards and I'll give you some ideas. The, today, though, uh, during Come For More, I'm going to be uh, teaching a class on our discipleship groups. And we're going we're gonna to steal uh, one of the classrooms. We're going to actually meet over here. Uh, if you're in Jim Gardner's, uh, the elders going deeper class, you'll be in the library uh, this morning. But we're going to spend some time talking about discipleship groups, why we're doing them, and I'm going to teach you uh, how, how to kind of run them and navigate them. And my encouragement is, is if you're interested, if you've signed up for a discipleship group, uh, if you're interested in hearing more about discipleship group, just come to the time. At 11 o'clock, we'll be over here in this section. Uh, I, I will guarantee this. Even if you choose not to join a discipleship group, I will teach you how to run one. Uh, and it... Technically, it could take the first five minutes of the class, and you could walk out of here and be able to do it, uh, but we're going to encourage you to be part of that. So uh, that'll be in here at 11 o'clock, uh, but we encourage you to connect. God wants to use the church family to support one another, and so this is a great way to do that. So would you pray with me as we dive into God's Word this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you. Uh, that you've given us a place that we can gather together, that your body can come forth and, and celebrate and worship you. That you've given us a building and electricity and, and air conditioning and seats. Those things are unnecessary, but we are grateful for them. But you've given us a place that we can all gather together and we can celebrate who you are. And so, Lord, we, we have gathered to worship you this morning. We've come in celebration of what Jesus has done, and, and we look forward to hearing from you. Father, we are grateful for the worship that we've had so far, the fellowship that we get to do, spending time together, the, the offerings that we get to give, the prayer we have, the songs that we get to sing that are geared to shifting our hearts to worship, Lord. And now getting into your word. So, Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us this morning. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, your entire life, you've heard a saying, you are what you eat. It sometimes is kind of like one of those sayings where if you sit too close to the TV, you'll go blind. And if you make that face, you'll, it'll stick like that. All right. Uh, but the truth is what we ingest into our body will reflect out of us. And I, I'm not talking about just physically eating. I'm talking about everything that we take into our minds, into our hearts, into our spirits, will have dramatic impact on who we are as people. 
I want you to consider the music you listen to. I couldn't stand up here and sing most worship songs without seeing the words. I don't know why that is. You start playing it, I probably will figure it out. But if I walk into a store and hear a song for the 90s, somehow my brain immediately knows all the words to that. I don't think I've listened to a radio in years because I don't have one that works in my car. Uh, but I just don't listen to music. But I can walk into a store and hear songs from 20-some years ago and realize that I still know the lyrics to it. And I didn't even listen to that music. Because what we take into ourselves is what shapes and molds us. And we as God's people are hungry people. We are hungry for something in our lives. And what typically happens due to sin is that we hunger after things that fulfill immediate desires. I'm hungry, so I eat. I'm thirsty, so I drink. I'm tired, so I sleep, or I'm tired and I have to do things, and so I drink a lot of caffeine. I'm bored, and so I eat. I've had a hard day, so I turn on the TV. If it's the news, it'll just get harder. I don't know why we do that to ourselves. I've had a long day. I doom scroll on my phone. I've had a long day. I got to go to my comfortable places. We we live in a society now in a country that the that the answer to the long day is I go to drink or I find a special gummy. I find some way to fix the hunger in me, the desire for something more, because the reality is that every broken person desires for something more because we were created for something more. And so we hunger. And what is the natural reaction to our sinful nature is to pursue something that will gratify this immediate need in our lives rather than seek what is healthy for us in the long run. And so that's our story today. Is, is we see Jesus begin to address the hunger inside of people and the reaction or the action that people take in the midst of God himself. What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for the things of God? Like if I, if I take this service to like two o'clock today, we're going to still be hungry for that? All of you wearing Packers jerseys in the middle of the sanctuary? I think you will, but I I want you to really consider what you hunger for. Do you hunger for Jesus and all of who he is? I think we would say yes. I think the disciples in the midst of all the ministry that Jesus was doing would say yes. But I want you to watch it because I think think this is kind of cool that John frames this conversation in this way. So Jesus has fed the 5,000. He's done an incredible miracle. And he gets overwhelmed by the people, I think, or or, or just needs his own space. This is really cool because the end of last week, we talked about this. Verse 15, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew into the mountains by himself. Discipleship is imitating Christ. Jesus constantly went off by himself to pray. And so in the midst of this moment that would be overwhelming to, I think, any of us, Jesus takes time and he goes away to pray. And he he essentially becomes missing to everyone. No one knows where he's at. And so this is where our scripture starts. Jesus is off praying. He's just done an incredible miracle. The disciples who are following Jesus, who call him Lord, who know what he's all about, they, uh, I think they get kind of tired. Like, they, hey, it's it's nighttime. We got to go to bed. Uh, so this is what happens. Uh-oh, I'm not on, maybe. There we go. Hmm. Uh, 
When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. This is John chapter 6, verse 16. Got into a boat and started across the sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. I want you to, I want you to picture this in your mind. I want, you to, I want you to imagine that you are these disciples, and you are sitting in this boat, and you are rowing across the sea, of Capernaum, and you are trying to get to the other side to go to sleep. And then here's the thing. This sea, it sits in a place where as the wind blows, it buffets the water all the time. So it is it is a normal occurrence. This isn't something crazy that would happen. Now, who's in this boat? Several fishermen. And if you know fishermen, they would deal with this kind of weather to fish. It's how they provide for themselves. It's how they feed their families. And so the water itself shouldn't be shocking to them. The storm itself shouldn't be shocking to them, but there begins to arise in them this deep, unsettling fear. And what happens next? Jesus shows up. I think we live in a place that sometimes we're in this deep, unsettling fear, and Jesus shows up. But what happens when Jesus shows up? They were frightened. I I, I want you to hear that. In the midst of their tumultuous boat ride, God himself shows up in the midst of it and their fear rises. Why? Why does when God show up into our midst, do we get scared? What's Jesus' response? But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. We, We come to Jesus. We expect a lot of Jesus. We want Jesus to work in our lives. And then when he shows up, There is trepidation, there is fear, there is a lack of understanding. I want you to imagine this. Not only are some of them fishermen, but they have traveled with Jesus for a while now. And what has Jesus done? He's turned water into wine, he's healed the lame, he has caused people on the verge of death to come back to life. They have seen Jesus do things that they know only God can do. And and what do we know about God? Who's in control of the weather? God is. My kids sing it all the time. Who's in the middle of the storm? God is. My little one sings it as she goes up the stairs into the dark. Who's in the middle of the dark? God is. So the other day I asked her, I said, hey, can you go up to your room and get this? She said, dad, it's dark. I said, it'll be okay. You'll be fine. She's like, can I do it without singing my song? And I was like, no, you should sing your song. You should sing your song. You should realize that God's in control. And she she was like, yeah, he is. And then she went upstairs and played, even though it was scary and dark. But here's the thing. We, We desire for Jesus to show up in our lives. We want him to do things. And when he does, it it doesn't turn out how we would imagine it. Because never in the history of of the world has anyone walked across water. And here Jesus is in the middle of this crazy waves on the Sea of Capernaum, and he is standing there in the midst of his disciples. The God who created weather, who's in control of it, who decides when the wind blows. 
in their sphere. I think that's our natural sinful response to the presence of Jesus in our life. It gets scary. It truly gets scary for us when Jesus shows up and he wants to do something. But here's the cool response. In the book of John, there are seven I am statements. The problem is there are actually more. Uh, because if we don't read it in the original language, we can't see the context of that. But what Jesus says to them is, it is I, which is the same exact language when he says, I am the bread of life, I am the resurrection of life, I am the way, the truth of life. It is the same statement. And what he's quoting is the conversation that God has in the Old Testament when he says, I am who I am. Why are you afraid is what he's asking. I am here. And I am God. I I like this picture of verse 21, though, because I I think it's kind of interesting. Jesus declares ultimately to them, I am God. And then all of a sudden, the boat is immediately on land. I don't know if Jesus just like teleports the boat there or if like every, like the water just pushes it really fast. Like John is very intentional with his wording. And it very clearly says that then they were glad to take him into the boat. They were like, yes, okay, you're here. You got things under control. Uh, Then immediately the boat was on land. I don't know why that's there, but I find it very interesting. So here's the disciples. Jesus always comes to his people first to remind them of who he is, because what is the expectation for God's people? That we would take what he pours into us into others. And so he is training the disciples and saying, this is what it looks like to go out and serve others. This is what it looks like to be in the presence and the power of God Almighty. So on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. I think that's awesome. Right? They they showed up to hear Jesus teach. They wanted to see a miracle. They saw a miracle, and now they're going after Jesus. What I find interesting about this section is Jesus often hides what he's doing. He's very intentional about only showing God when he needs to. And yet, here's the funny thing. I think that all of these people realize that Jesus did something beyond their belief. Somehow, Jesus slipped away from them. Somehow, Jesus crossed the sea without a boat. But this is the realization of humans stuck in sinful nature. They don't see the works of God. They desire to be in his presence. They desire to go after him. But they don't see the truth in what he has done. And so what do they do? Jesus is gone. He did some incredible things yesterday. Let's go find him. It's a good attitude. Heart? We're going to find out the heart part. All right, verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. What did Jesus tell him? Eternal life comes through me. Everything you're hungering for comes through me. 
the desire of your life, the desire to find truth, the desire to find the things that you need, it comes through me. But where was their heart? Why did they come follow Jesus? Well, he can feed us. We are in the what I consider the worst time to ever be an American. Not like con- just today, I just meant election time. Why? Cuz the vast majority of Americans vote for who can give them the most things they desire. We should vote based on what we believe is righteous in the eyes of God. Now, the truth is that no one is worthy. But we have a choice that we can actively say, okay, God, what is best? Now, here's the the reality. I don't care who wins. I do care who wins because I think it matters to God. But I don't care who wins because God is in control. And God is on the throne. And even if America burns down tomorrow, guess what? Who's still on the throne? Jesus is. And because of that, I do not get overwhelmed by this. I'm not angry about it. It makes me sad and I grieve. But it's not overwhelming to me. Why? Because I don't hunger for anyone to fix my issues. I hunger for Jesus to step into my life and transform me. What they wanted was for Jesus to come in and free them from captivity. I want Jesus to do that too. If Jesus could show up, we were driving to a a football game for Josiah on Uh, yesterday and we drove past this church that just had a sign out that I was like, I wouldn't put that on my sign, but it was hilarious. Uh, And it said, Jesus is coming back, hopefully before the election. And I thought, you know what? Yes. Yes. Why? Because we want humans to fix our brokenness. We want things to fix our brokenness. We hunger for life. And what we do is we consume the wrong things. Next time you're in a fight with someone, stop and pray together. Next time you're frustrated with someone about the election, stop and pray for them. Next time you're frustrated with your president, whoever they may be, stop and pray for them because God is in control. God allows people to sit on thrones. It changes your perspective when it's about being consumed by Jesus, being full of Jesus, being controlled and led by Jesus. And what happens is in the midst of this is all of these people show up. And their desire is not to be reigned and ruled by the king. It's to take care of their general needs. Hey, if if Jesus could just show up and fix my house. If Jesus could go and provide the food I need. If G- and then when we get that, what happens? Jesus showed up and fed them. What was their response? More, please. And what would happen if Jesus just kept feeding them? Would they have found life eternal? No. We often have a consumer mentality, not just to the way we live our lives in the United States, but to the way we pursue Jesus. I'm going to put in so God gives back. It's a vending machine. 
I did really good today, God. Here's my goodness. I would like C4, please. Why do we do that? Because we hunger. There is a genuine hunger in our lives for something greater. There is a desire. Why? They followed Jesus. Why? Because he was doing things that were incredible. What attracts us to things? Because it piques our interests. Because it's amazing. Because it's interesting. Because we like it. Because it fills a need. And so we, we go after and we pursue things that are unnecessary for our lives, but they, they feel that hunger in us, the desire to seek after something more. And, and here's the beauty of Jesus. When Jesus fed them the day before, do you think he knew exactly what was going to happen the next day? Absolutely. Do you know what Jesus still did? He still fed them. He still fed him. He wasn't concerned about the momentary attitude. He was concerned about their eternal perspective. He wanted to change them. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. What were the signs pointing to? The Messiah coming. God coming to them, God being present, God freeing them again from their captivity. They thought their captivity was not being their own rulers. Their captivity was sin and the slavery to it. And so their expectation when the Messiah showed up was that he would free them and they would rule the world. I think that's sometimes our expectation. If we could just get a Christian leader on the presidential throne of the United States of America, it'll change the trajectory of the United States of America. If we, if God's people, seek out Jesus, it'll change the direction of ourselves and the people around us. It's God's kingdom. What's going to happen in the end? Who's going to hit their knees? Everyone. Everyone. And so we desire these immediate, and here's the thing, I get it. I get it. I, I look at, I buy the groceries. I look at the grocery bill. I'm like, this is insanity. I get that life is hard now. We still have way more than 95% of the world. And we are called not to have, but to serve in some men. We are called to be hungry for what Jesus has to offer. Do not work for food that perishes, but the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. This is the thing. Jesus wants to. He wants to do incredible things in our life. He desires and hopes and comes after us. Every story about Jesus is about him pursuing the lives of men and women because he desires for them to re-enter into the relationship that they were created for. You and I were created to glorify God and to live in a relationship with him. And sin broke that. And so what Jesus did was he pursued the world by coming into it and showing the world who he was so that ultimately when he gave his life on the cross, that those that put their faith in that would find eternal life in him, in him alone. But the desire didn't end there. The desire was for to see the people grow and be transformed. Our salvation, yes, starts at the day we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. That we believe in our heart, we repent. He's Lord of our lives, Lord. We, we have a hard time with that one. And when that happens, what happens? He works our salvation out in us. 
which means over the course of the rest of your life, whether it's one day, one week, a hundred years, your job is to grow to be more like Jesus. And how do we do that? He feeds us. He continues to feed us over and over again. He gives to us what is sustaining and what is lasting. And it's not about our physical needs. It's about what deeply we need more than anything else is nourishment of our souls, our spirits. And so he gives. God does provide for us. I think it was fitting that Forrest read that scripture. Why worry about the food that we eat or the clothes we wear? Because people would complain if I showed up in here in my Kirby t-shirt and my gym shorts. Which if you run into me anywhere outside of the church, I'm probably wearing. (laughs) Why? Why does it matter? Why do we care about those things? I have a friend who many, many years ago, this actually happened to me too, but we walked different paths. So this is kind kind of interesting. I never thought about it this way. Uh, He went to a church. Uh, It's kind of um, emo-y in his dress. But he's wearing a hat. Someone knocked the hat off his head and was like, we don't wear those in church. And the same thing happened to me. I was a pastor at the time. It wasn't even a Sunday morning. I was just wearing a hat in the church. It didn't bother me. The other, my friend, just slowly walked away from Jesus. Now, I don't, I don't think it's that, like, moment, like, oh, that hat 10 years ago that someone knocked off my head, right? But when, when we are the people of God and we don't pour out Jesus around us, we care about things that don't matter. And, And we pursue things that don't matter. Like this is this is Jesus saying to these people that came back to him the next day and saying, "Listen, food doesn't matter. What matters is your internal life. You 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 want me to fix things, but you don't really want what I have to offer. So what do we do then? That's the question. That's the same question they ask, which I think is I think is fitting. Verse twenty eight. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? What are we supposed to do? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. We believe in Jesus. We believe that when Jesus walks across the tumultuous sea that we're sitting on in our lives and he shows up, that we don't run away in fear. We say, okay, Jesus, what do I do? That we're not afraid of it. That we're not afraid of what God is doing in our lives. We're not afraid of what God is asking us to do. No matter how hard it is to do. To give up jobs, to to walk away from friends, to, to move your family, to traveling across the ocean, to share Jesus with people. Whatever God calls us to do. To go talk to that neighbor that you haven't talked to in 10 years because they cut your grass the wrong way. It's, it's scary to us. It's hard. Life is hard. And so what happens in the midst of our trying to follow Jesus is Jesus shows up. And, and typically our rela- reaction to that is like, that's ah, too scary. It's, so what do we do? We believe in him. I'm not talking, this is not John saying we just believe in his salvation. We believe that Jesus is Lord of our lives. That he has what is best for us, planned out and prepared for us. That he knows our desires and the desires of our heart. And he will give us that, not because the desires we have are about things, but because our desire truly is about feeding that hunger within us the presence of God in our lives. 
And so what he asks us to do is he asks us to come to him, to trust him, to have faith in him, to understand who he is, to follow his teachings, to obey him, to love him, to seek him out, to be filled with him so that we can then pour that out. When, when Jesus shows up into our midst, we should be excited. When Jesus shows up into our midst, we should be hungry. When Jesus shows up into our midst, we should move. This is uh, something I often share with people that go on mission trips. So I'm going to share with you, Liberians team, right now. I typically don't want to hear from missions teams actually for like several weeks later. And this is the reason why. I call it the mission trip hangover. What often happens is God does incredible, incredible things when you go on a mission trip. No matter... If what type of trip it is, no matter what you were doing, what God does is he gets the chance in that moment of life for you to actually be surrendered, whether you chose to or not. And he gets the ability to speak louder than probably he's ever spoken. And so what happens is you go on a trip and you do all kinds of things and you see God work incredibly and you're totally caught up into the hype of it. And you're so excited when uh, this happens, right? You can, we, we can uh, attest this to districts. When the kids go to districts, we can attest this to any big conference you went to. I have no doubt that you went to a conference and you were like, the worship was so good. The teaching was so good. Why don't we do this at our church? There's a lot of reasons why, we, you know, we're not, we're not lighting up smoke machines up here. It's not happening. But what happens is, is we come back and we're so excited. Let me tell you what God did. That's great. But then it wears off. And what happens after a few weeks? We've returned to our normal life. We forgot all the things that God had just done. I realize as a pastor that you remember like one of the words I say in the seven months I've been here. Right? And I know this from personal things of like, I can't remember all the things I've heard over my years in the church. But I can remember when the Spirit has spoken to me. And when Christ has shown up and shown me things. And the the scary part is, is when that happens, whether or not we seek to hold on to that or just keep letting Jesus pour into us. We live in a culture that the greatest four years of people's lives were when they were 14 to 18. The greatest days of your lives are ahead of you serving and being transformed by Jesus. And so what he desires of us, what the work of God is, is the trust in Jesus. Now here, here's the... Here's the thing that blows me away about the people, like, and I, because I think this is us too, if they're like, oh, okay, that's good. That's good. That's, that makes sense, right? So, what's the people's response? So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Do you see that? Jesus just fed them yesterday. How easily we forget about what God has done in our lives. And so he says, they continue, what work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Really? Did Jesus not just feed you yesterday? What happened in the wilderness? They got fed and then they complained some more. They got water and they complained some more. Our natural human sinful nature is to see God do work and incredible things in our life and then complain some more. Jesus then said, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. 
I want you to I want you to think about that. I want you to think about your reaction to when Jesus shows up. I want you to think about the times that Jesus has done incredible things in your life. And I want you to think about what happens in the coming day. Because here's here's what I think Jesus wants us to happen. He wants us to believe in him. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to dwell daily in his presence. Why? Because he knows the next day we're going to forget. And he knows the next day we're going to lose sight. And do you know what our God does when that happens? He abandons us. He leaves us to our own devices. He just lets us know. He pursues. And he continues to pursue. And he continues to pursue. And he continues to pursue. How many of you have had a rough day? in your life. Anyone? Anyone had a rough day in their life? How many of you had a rough week? Year? Years? Did did God pursue you? How many of you did the worst thing imaginable that you could possibly think of and, and Jesus forgave you? Why? Because God so loved the world that he sent his only son to pursue us. And so what Jesus desires is for us to to be hungry for him. And he wants to give us everything we need to nourish us, to sustain us, to give us life everlasting, to transform us. I guarantee that if you said, I've been following Jesus for X amount of years, days, or weeks, that you are not the same person you were at the beginning of that. Why? Not because you pursued something that made you a better person. Because you allowed Jesus to work. You believed and trusted in him. You had faith. And here's here's the reaction. Ignore the verse 35. We're not going to talk about that one. Verse 34. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Now, I want you to understand something. They said that. They didn't believe it. And we're going to see that in the next few weeks. But they desired. They, 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 there is something that Jesus said that resonated with him. But then the next day comes. The Holy Spirit can speak so loud and clear into our lives and then the next day comes and we're hungry again and we're thirsty and we desire something. Jesus in the book of John has already declared that he will quench our thirst and feed us, right? We don't need anything else. And so how do we fulfill that deep need in our lives? How do we, how do we pursue Jesus in a way that he pursues us? We surrender and submit. We seek him out on a daily basis. How do we do that? We talk to him. We pray. How do we hear from him? We read our Bibles. It's how God speaks to us. How do we know if we're hearing right? We seek the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We surround ourselves with other believers. They will hold us accountable. It's like discipleship group should be a thing or something. I don't know. Your growth happens because you surrender to Jesus. He is pursuing you. He wants so much more from you. He desires a deep, deep relationship with you. I don't have any healthy relationships. I got Jesus. I don't have it all figured out. I got Jesus. I don't know what I'm supposed to do in this world. Guess what? I still got Jesus. End of the day. You know what? I sought Jesus today. I did everything I felt like the Spirit told me. Good work. Wake up. Seek Jesus again because it's not going to be easier tomorrow. Especially as you get older, right? You get up. You pop. You creak. Your, your first thing is, thank you, God, that I was able to get out of bed today. Now, what do you want to do with me? Because you're here, right? 
means God wants to use you and he wants to transform you and he wants you to seek him daily. That hunger inside of you, do not replace it with anything but Jesus because he wants to fill it up. Do not hesitate and be terrified when Jesus shows up in your life. I know countless stories of people who got to the end of the ropes, sat in their rooms and prayed, Jesus, if you don't show up tonight, I'm done. Guess who showed up? Jesus. So we're in a boat. It's probably got holes in it. The waves are crashing around us. Sorry, you have no trolling motor. You got paddles. One's broke. Your arms hurt. You're hungry. You're tired. You're frustrated. The world is beating you up. Life is hard. Jesus comes strolling across the water. What do you do? Do we run in fear? Or do we trust in belief? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you again for Jesus. God, that you would pursue a person like me. A person that fails daily. A person that desires to be fed by you, Lord, but often fills himself with other things. God, I want to I want to be in a place where I see the feeding of Jesus and I understand it and I know it so well that that's all I desire. Jesus, I, I want to say I'm sorry for when you pursue me and I miss it. Or when I choose to disobey it. Or when even I'm afraid of it. I want this food, Lord, that you have. And so, Lord, help me to understand it. Help me, help it to nourish me so that a second later I'm not hungry again. Jesus, just th- we thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do for us. God, we love you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God, we are hungry and we are thirsty. And we joyfully confess that we do not have the ability to feed ourselves. That the drink and the food that we provide is not enough to satisfy. So God, we give it up. We give up trying to satisfy ourselves. We give up trying to work for the bread that does not fill us up. And we seek you, God. And I pray that as we go from this place, we would not forget what you have done in our hearts. And tomorrow when we get up, it would be the first thought that we need you. We praise you for what you've done, God. Make it clear to our hearts and our minds as we go from this place. In Jesus' name.